Dr. Aronica, welcome. Thank you, Buma, for having me. You know, I, I know you and I have exchanged messages, have a lot of mutual friends, so it's a pleasure to have you on the show today. And we're going to dive into one of my favorite topics, which is epigenetics. So if it's okay with you, can we, uh, yeah, can we get sure. started? Epigenetics is also my favorite topic. <laughs> So, and I apologize for the elementary question to begin here, but I think it's worth setting framework for people. Um, how would you define epigenetics for somebody who's really coming across this for the first time? It's quite the buzzword these days, but I figure it's best to ask the expert. Yes. So epi means on the top. And so on the top of our genes, there are um, molecular marks, molecular uh, tags that can turn genes on or off, just like a dimmer switch modulates um, lights up and down in the room. And these are epigenetic marks. And epigenetic marks are so fundamental um, to the way we look and perform. Um, for example, we have the same DNA, the same genes, in every single cell of our body, and yet our eye cells look different from our hair cells. So the same information, the same hardware, but different software, different tags, epigenetic marks that program the genes to be turned on or off differentially in different cells. And this makes the magic of uh, uh, making these cells look and function differently from each other. All right. So that, that's awesome. And thank you for making that absolutely crystal clear. Now, there's something in there that you said, which was epigenetic marks and just sort of uh, methodologies that we can, or just sort of mechanisms for us to make those marks. And one of the ones that I increasingly come across and causes a lot of confusion is methylation. Do you mind just, and I know methylation is a very complex process, but if you're able to just sort of explain for us what methylation means. Sure. And thank you for this question, uh, which I think is uh, clinically relevant and also for uh, the large public. Um, so first of all, um, uh, um, uh, we, um, so methylation reactions are fundamental to our life, but they don't only pertain to epigenetics. And on the other side, epigenetics is not only about methylation. We have several classes of epigenetic marks, and uh, um, I had an opportunity to work on three of the major uh, classes of epigenetic marks. So we have non-coding RNAs, uh, which are called non-coding because they don't produce proteins. We know that usually we have learned in the, in the biology classes that um, the mRNA, the messenger RNA, uh, is, the, is a molecule that produced uh, that is a messenger um, for uh, the production of proteins in our body. Uh, but these non-coding RNAs don't produce protein. Then there are um, histone modifications, which means histones are uh, the protein that um, pack the DNA inside our cell, cells and coil the DNA so that um, uh, the, 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 DNA, the, the DNA is very compact when uh, it's closed and genes are off. And then when it's open, um, so histones and, and the DNA are open, the chromatin is open, then the gene, gene is turned on. Um, and this histone modification can be methylation, but also acetylation, phosphorylation, ubiquitinylation. So there are so many other marks. And then there is DNA methylation, so which is the methylation of the DNA itself. So not the histones, but the DNA and specifically the cytosines, one of the four nucleotides of the DNA within the context of 
so-called CG nucleotide, uh, which is so the a dinucleotide in, um, of C and G's um, uh, sequentially together. Mm -hmm. And so to answer your questions, yes, methylation is one of the many uh, epigenetic modifications and it can be either on the DNA, DNA methylation, or on the histones. And, uh, uh, but we can measure um, uh, with uh, uh, much more accuracy uh, the DNA methylation on, on, on our, uh, so the, the methylation on our DNA, DNA methylation. And that's why DNA methylation is one of the most used uh, tools to measure um, epigenetic uh, marks, especially in the context of uh, uh, lifestyle interventions. Amazing. And Dr. Aronica, you seem to be providing me like perfect segues today. And so you mentioned something there about lifestyle interventions. And I want to just pick your brain on your particular focus these days, which are, I mean, as of late, it may not be these days, but uh, around diet and just sort of the diet's influence on the epigenome, because we're all inundated with this diet, that diet, and I'm sure it's all very, very confusing for everybody listening here. But what do we know in terms of the relation between diet and its influence on epigenetics? And I, I want to definitely get into low carb versus high carb diets with you as well. Yes, these are uh, one of, uh, of the questions that is uh, uh, dearest to my heart. Um, so one of the most exciting properties of epigenetic marks is that unlike genetic marks, epigenetic marks are flexible and respond to environmental um, signals. And one of these signals is diet, is the most powerful signals uh, to our genes. And that's why food is not only calories, uh, but also information, and is one of the most studied um, and the one that we can control most because we all eat every day, multiple times a day. So I'm I am really fascinated with diet, and that's why actually I moved to Stanford. I was previously uh, studying uh, epigenetic marks in uh, single model systems at the University of Vienna and then Oxford, but then. My dream was to study how diet can change epigenetic marks within the context of a lifestyle intervention. And uh, because um, I switched to a low carb diet uh, during my um, doctorate, uh, mm. I really wanted to- And so uh, just for everybody listening here, before low carb, what did Dr. Aronica's diet look like uh, sort of pre-doctorate? <laughs> I'm Italian, so uh, <laughs> I can't come from Italy. I was born and raised in Italy, mm -hmm. and so my my uh, diet was a typically uh, typical diet with the uh, with the uh, three P's: pasta, pane, and pizza. Pane yeah. means bread mm -hmm. um, and, and potatoes. I can mm -hmm. I can add that. So uh, very rich in carbohydrates. Uh, I I must say that anyway. Uh, the, the, in, in Italy, we have a, a special uh, uh, relationship with food. Mm -hmm. There was also quantities important. I, I was not overeating. So overall, I was not uh, overweight. It's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is also important. Um, uh, health uh, goes beyond weight. Mm -hmm. There are even people that are so-called toffee, um, <laughs> which are thin outside and fat inside. Mm -hmm. um, so uh, it's, uh, um, uh, yeah. But anyway, I switched to a, a, a high fat, low carb body diet during mm -hmm. my PhD studies because I, um, I read uh, one book by uh, Gary Tobes, uh, Good Calories, Bad Calories. This is an, an in-depth review of the literature about the evidence of, uh, of um, around the role of fats in our diet. Mm -hmm. And so because I'm very like in the, uh, theoretically driven um, as a person, I was uh, 
captivated by that book and uh, mm -hmm. I, I decided to do an experiment in my own kitchen and switch to a low carbohydrate diet and so anyway uh, then my dream was to study the epigenetic effects of a, a low carbohydrate diet uh, in, in people and uh, uh, there was a study the Stanford diet fit study um, which um, was a, a randomized clinical trial with the, 608 people were randomly assigned to either a whole food low carb carbohydrate diet or a whole food uh, low fat diet for one year. And this was the largest randomized clinical trial ever undertaken in the, um, in the field of precision health. Why, mm -hmm. why, what is this field all about? It's about collecting many, many biomarkers about people's health. So genetics, epigenetics, microbiome, in order to use those biomarkers to make um, personalized recommendation for people who are those who are more likely to respond to a low carb diet, who are those who are more likely to respond to a low fat diet. So anyway, I joined the study um, and, uh, and then I measured the DNA methylation of people before and after a low carb and a low fat diet. And uh, the results were surprising. We still didn't publish those, uh, those data and uh, uh, we need to do uh, that. And I'm actually now uh, resuscitating that project, but I can give you some- Yeah, uh, let's get some hints. Can you give us some hints as to what the results yeah, were? Some hints. Yeah, so I think for me, one of the most surprising findings was that we uh, um, we uh, found that uh, a low fat and a low carbohydrate diet uh, trigger completely different epigenetic changes. So the overlap between the genes that showed the greatest uh, change after the diet was was none. There were, really? Wow. The, 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 yeah. So it, this was uh, was staggering and. Uh, um, and also the genes involved were, uh, were um, uh, uh, mediating different pathways. Um, uh, intu intuitively, we see that, um, for example, genes that are required for uh, um, uh, fat metabolism uh, um, uh, showed like um, uh, a, a decrease in DNA methylation. Mm -hmm. uh, after the low carbohydrate diet, which means they were probably turned on. Mm -hmm. um, but also genes involved in the immune pathway, uh, natural killer cells, uh, activation of natural killer cells were activated in the low carb diet. Whereas in the low fat diet, we saw some uh, um, actually um, activation of uh, uh, tumor suppressor genes uh, for uh, uh, for colon cancer, so wow. different pathways, and uh, uh, and uh, I mean uh, this is exciting. These were anyway whole food diets, so mm -hmm. both diets were pretty healthy, and most subjects anyway reduced their overall carbohydrate consumption because even the people in the low um, fat group were encouraged to cut out refined grains and sugars, which led inevitably to a reduction of overall carbohydrate intake. So overall people lost weight and improved their markers and probably also their epigenetics. Um, and there is a, a, a recent study uh, um, that showed that epigenetic marks and DNA methylation mark revert to a younger stage yeah after um, a lifestyle intervention involving a low carb diet, uh, intermittent fasting, a mild exercise and uh, stress reduction. This is a, a study by Dr. Cara Fitzgerald, uh, Moshe uh, Zaif, and uh, I had the, the privilege of uh, interviewing uh, uh, Cara. You can watch the, the interview on my YouTube channel. Mm -hmm. Um, and uh, yeah, she she gave a lecture for for a core course that I teach at Stanford Continuing Studies. It's called Longing for Longevity. I think probably your audience may be interested 
in this course uh, from biology to biohacking. And I mm. teach this course um, with another Italian and she's a, a CEO of, um, of a company that produces, uh, so develops a, a cellular blocker drugs. So mm -hmm. it's an exciting course. Uh, we had uh, also Vasper Longo and uh, Claudio Franceschi and many other speakers. It was it's fun. pretty much everybody in the longevity field right now. <laughs> No, it was it was a very fun fun course, and we are uh, teaching this again. I think in winter. Mm -hmm. Are you teaching it in Italy, or is this this is available no, online? No, this is correct? a Stanford continuing studies, mm -hmm. so people can uh, enroll uh, now. It, it's not on on the catalog, so they need to wait. I think the winter uh, quarter uh, they can even order a certificate. So it's a professional development uh, course. We had some clinicians, but also um uh, biohackers or uh, investors yeah. it was fun so dr aronica i want to go back to these diets because you know based on this recent diet about epigenetic age and uh, the low carb uh, the, the recent study about epigenetic age and low carb diet, um, it, it appears that there's somewhat of a bias in studies towards low carb diets is i mean based on the data that you're analyzing right now do you feel like there are certain people that may do better with a modest or even high amount of carbohydrates? I guess looking at just kind of certain types of populations, if you will. This is an important question. So personalized nutrition yeah. requires that we, we, we look at the outliers. So, you know, most, most people can... Uh, I think benefit uh, from a low carb diet, but there are people, uh, for example, we know that one in four people um, are high, uh, so high, high responders to a, a low carb diet, which means that um, they tend to experience a significant increase in uh, uh, LDL cholesterol after starting a, a low carb diet. Is this the APOE4 uh, variant or is it something else? No, this is okay. a very complicated, complex. I mean, um, uh, the um, uh, let me first give you an intro. So uh, this is due to genetic factors, yes. Mm -hmm. um, but which factors we still don't know. We okay. know some very rare mutations that cause, for example, familiar hyper hypercholesterolemia and related disorders, and these are mutation in the uh, LDL receptors, uh, APOB, uh, and other genes. Um, and then we know that there are several uh, common genetic variants, um, APOB, uh, PIPAR alpha, um, that have been associated, uh, also um, uh, APOE2, that have been associated um, with an increase in LDL with um, uh, high uh, fat uh, intake, will increase the high fat intake. But, and this is the, the problem, all these associations have been made in uh, within observational studies yeah. uh, with people that also had a high carbohydrate um, intake. So they are basically useless to predict whether your cholesterol is going to go up in the context of a, a low carb um, a whole food diet and whether this matter because we know that whether with a low carb diet yes you can you can see an increase in ldl cholesterol but um, this is associated with increase in in size of the ldl uh, uh, particle not in the particle number and mm -hmm. this is something that is beneficial so larger ldl uh, is less heterogenic, the small, dense LDL. So you may have an increase in total cholesterol, which actually reflects a beneficial increase in size rather than number. And we also see that a low, with a low carb diet, you have a decrease in triglycerides and HDL. So other two positive uh, changes in blood lipids that all together this is actually a positive change. And we just published a paper on this topic last week. 
Wow. It's, uh, we, we looked at uh, the blood cholesterol of uh, changes of, uh, of the, uh, the low carb dieters within our study. And uh, so these low carb dieters, they did low carb, high fat, they increased their cholesterol intake up to two, more than two times that was what was previously recommended. So up to, I think, an average of 700 milligram um, of cholesterol per day, which is more than twice as much than the previous upper limit of 300 uh, milligram. And surprise, surprise, this increase in dietary cholesterol was not associated with the, an increase in blood cholesterol. And it was associated with an increase in triglycerides and, in, uh, and the increase in HDL. So overall, a good uh, change. Now, as you pointed out, this is, the, uh, this is a, an average. And our study was uh, a very specific, uh, was, was looking at healthy people. So people that, who have uh, insulin resistance or diabetic people may react very differently. And it was a weight loss study with a, a healthy whole food diet. All these variables mm -hmm. affect the interactions between genes and, uh, and, uh, uh, the, and the, your LDL response, whether you have a response and whether this is bad for you. So context is always important, as you pointed out. Um, and uh, the, the APOE4 gene is more related to um, so a concern around saturated fats um, and the uh, uh, risk of Alzheimer's disease and uh, cardiovascular disease. Um, uh, this is actually a very common variant. Uh, <clears throat> so 25% of people carry at least one of or, or copy of APOE4. But this is not again a dead sentence. Uh, yeah. Although this gene, yeah, it's been associated with al Alzheimer, um, uh, it's actually more prevalent uh, among uh, um, uh, African um, so um, uh, populations uh, in Nigerians, where the risk of uh, Alzheimer is lower because in the context of a non-Westernized diet and lifestyle actually that form might have had some advantages. We know that it was the actually the ancestral form, the original form of the gene. Yeah. And it's um, as some protective effects um, uh, in, in the context of a non-Westernized diet, because actually it's a pro-inflammatory gene. So we need to uh, acute information to better fight pathogens, for example. So it was selected through evolution. But then in the context of chronic inflammation, where we, we are not fighting anymore uh, an acute um, uh, uh, infection, but we are just chronically exposed to inflammation, then, then that gene can cause inflammation. Inflammation is a big, huge component of Alzheimer's disease and cardiovascular disease. Thank you for, for walking. And I know because I, I'm a person who trounces around the dark corners of the internet, I know there's a lot of forums out there for APOE uh, variants, and they can be quite dark at times. So I'm really glad that you shed light on the history and the evolutionary perspective there. It's uh, it's very helpful. It, so coming back uh, to, to the diet aspect, if I were to just kind of glean some somewhat of a universal truth for diet, it appears that whole real foods tend to be better than preserved. Uh, but are there, like for instance, in uh, certain Asian populations, would they do better with slightly elevated carbohydrates or is that something that is still kind of TBD at this moment? Yeah, I wouldn't say that a whole ethnicity would be more of something, but I, I like how you frame the problem. Uh, I think for, for in order to make a recommendation for the best diet, you need to take into account this universal part. I think the universal part is 20% of the equation, so whole foods. But then there is the 20% part, which I agree with you must be determined like individually. Uh, we know that there is a, 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 an association between certain ethnicities 
and uh, um, with certain metabolic traits. For example, even Asian population, as you mentioned, are more likely to be toffee, uh, thin, uh, thin uh, outside and fat inside. I love that so term, actually, by the way. <laughs> I also love that. Uh, so I'm not sure whether they might be actually do, do better. Yes, they're 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 probably more used to um, a higher carbohydrate intake, um, but they they also have are also pretty good with the with the they used to be pretty good with the quality of fats like a ton of omega threes. Um, so I would say that there is a twenty percent of the equation for a good diet that is due to personal factors. These personal factors are genetics, but also the, our microbiome, our epigenetic that in part we inherited from our parents, in part we have built until now uh, with our previous history of eating exercises or not, not exercising. And all these per personal factors are 20% of the equations. Examples are food intolerances. Um, even, for example, fiber is good for you, but if you have a SIBO, a small intestine, uh, um, so bowel um, or bacterial overgrowth, uh, then you should avoid fiber. Um, and then uh, even uh, nutritious food like nightshades, uh, people, some people are intolerant. Uh, Omega-3s. Um, and uh, um, some people um, can actually more effectively use um, the omega trees from plant sources, whereas other people can't, or, or even uh, plant uh, uh, sterols. Uh, uh, plant sterols are believed to help actually lower your cholesterol, but there are people that have so-called um, a variant of the anti-vegetarian genes. I remember uh, that. Five and eight. <laughs> that actually respond can, can't really absorb more plant sterols and should even be avoiding uh, uh, sources of uh, um, plant sterols like vegetable oils, uh, sometimes even olives of, of avocado. Do, those conditions are very rare. There are even, even there, there are rare mutations in these genes and more common mutation with more subtle effects. So you've brought up genetics as a, a part of this a few times. Uh, there's a lot of commercially available genetics tests out there, and some of those companies have done quite a remarkable job of uh, advertising. And what would be, like, if somebody were to ask you today, or me, were to ask you the merits of genetics testing for this uh, movement in precision health, is a genetics test essential for that? And uh, if so, what are some of the insights that you could, that people should expect to glean out of that? Okay, overall, I'm excited for the field. I think that uh, genetics does play an important role in personalized medicine and nutrition. That said, uh, most of uh, the genetic interpretation tools out there um, do a very, uh, not, a, not a very good job. You could um, say poor job. It's okay. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for translating I, I, my uh, <laughs> uh, A poor job. Yes, a poor job um, in uh, really explaining what is the evidence uh, of that information and whether and the chances that that, that uh, information applies to the customers. What I'm, I, I mean is that for example, even for in the low carb and uh, low fat fields, uh, there are there are many uh, reports that tell you, ah, you have uh, this um, variant in uh, PIPAR alpha, and this is a contraindication for a, a high fat uh, ketogenic diet. Based on what? Based on observational studies that link this variant with the bad blood lipids in the context of a high carbohydrate diet with the uh, high fat intake. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, I don't know this, that you are telling me this information based on basically no, no evidence, no mm -hmm. evidence of this. And it's, it's very bad. So what um, I'm actually work, working on uh, 
on several uh, projects where I'm looking at uh, different genetic pathways, inflammation, uh, cardiometabolic, uh, detoxification, and narrowing down on the genetic variants that have been tested in people in intervention studies. So there is a difference between observational studies and intervention study, but when you, you know which, which subpopulation are you looking at, which intervention, whether they had the benefit. And only if we do that, we can come with a score of uh, uh, strength of evidence for that association. So that clinicians and people can use it and know how strong is the evidence. Okay, it's, it's, it's convincing, it's possible, it's uh, and, uh, and for which people? So in we in we in which context otherwise we are just you know it's it's uh, it's nice to gamify this field and uh, but uh, other than that uh, people need to be careful for example i always say that uh, 23me uh, predicted that i'm very likely to have um, straight hair look at me um, <laughs> uh, so it's uh, uh, and, and there is a reason for that I mean I um, uh, because uh, uh, complex traits like hair um, uh, your hair or also your response to a diet are uh, um, really re reflects the interaction of thousands of genes together and 23andMe is testing one or two or three or ten and that's not enough Mm -hmm. And this, the same is with APOE. I um, a 23 me tells you that you know I, I think it's nice to know your APOE status. Yeah. But at the same time, it's scary that they don't counsel people, and this and, means, and they don't know, give you context, right? So you get you get told that hey, I'm APOE three four four four, and all of a sudden you're like, oh my god, do I go jump off a cliff the next time I have a steak? Um, and and nothing again, I appreciate that they're proliferating or starting to proliferate the tests, but like there needs to be a certain level of context for people. And I really appreciate you giving that context here today. Uh, I guess just given because we're coming up on time here, Dr. Aronica, one sort of final question, if you will, the whole world of biological clocks, there are a lot of them. Um, I know you have obviously experience with with a number of them, and I would love to just hear just sort of what your opinions are on, and maybe even Horvath or whichever biological clock you think is best out there right now, and how should we view it? Um, just how can we use it for our everyday lives? That's a great question. So let me uh, zoom back um, uh, one second and explain. So these. Uh, um, uh, uh, so biological clocks um, are uh, um, uh, ways of measuring your biological age, which is the age of uh, uh, your cells and tissues and can actually be different from your chronological age. You can be biologically younger or older uh, than uh, your uh, chronological age. Uh, and there are many ways of uh, measuring it um, today, and there will be many more tomorrow, I'm sure. Uh, now we have molecular clocks, um, functional clocks, and digital clocks. Molecular clocks looks at your molecules um, and uh, um, the telomeres, but also epigenetics and the DNA methylation clocks and your questions pertain to DNA methylation clocks. But there are also di digital clocks, for example, facial recognition clocks um, and functional um, clocks where even a blood test uh, and a combination of different markers can be used to extrapolate your biological age. So within this context, molecular clocks and DNA methylation clocks, there have been more than, I think, uh, as, as of today, 13 uh, DNA methylation clocks published. Um, and, uh, um, uh, uh, and uh, they are all, uh, different, so they capture different uh, epigenetic signals across the genome, different CG sites. Mm -hmm. um, uh, and, uh, um, uh, and they all compare, so the, some of them are better 
at um, predicting some uh, um, mechanisms of aging, for example, cells and essence. Um, and some of them are more accurate to uh, correlate with the chronological age, like <laughs> uh, the, uh, the Orvat clock 2013 is the best uh, in terms of correlation, I think is 0.97. Um, wow. and, uh, uh, and yeah, so which is very precise. And so this is to say, when you ask me what is the best, I, I need to ask you back, what is your goal? Uh, because, um, for example, a clock that is more accurate at predicting chronological age um, may be um, more useful for uh, forensic purposes, right? <laughs> So in that case, you want you would go with that. Uh, but if you do an, a lifestyle intervention uh, and you want to see a change, then uh, it would be better to have a, a clock that reflects that change that you are looking for. And even in that biological age change, there are so many different signals. Uh, so there is the cell senescence, this is the um, cancerogenicity, um, and even, uh, you know, one thing I is an, an anecdotal observation that I did just with my students. Uh, some of my students are biohackers and they train, uh, they are trainers, and they are actually, when they take their um, epigenetic clock test, they uh, are biologically older than their chronological age and they are surprised they say like what's going on here mm -hmm. um and on one side it might be that exercise is a, an ornithic stress so at low doses is good and too much may be causing more biological age but on the other side it may also be that that intervention the exercise is actually um, uh, uh, inducing some uh, um, epigenetic changes um, that are not uh, captured by current clocks. So perhaps <laughs> they are rejuvenating, that signal is rejuvenating, but the overall uh, thing is seen as an acute stressor. I'm just pointing, so to go back to your question, is very difficult now. I think more, more clocks are coming, um, the question in the future will be to disentangle the biological. So if you want more a forensic like um, clock or a, a biological clock and measure uh, changes after a lifestyle intervention and which lifestyle interventions, because yeah. some clock might be measure better the difference, you know, um, the, the, the rejuvenation after exercise, rejuvenation after uh, mitochondrial um, uh, support uh, uh, therapy, uh, or, you know, I'm sure that there will be more precise clocks um, targeted to different outcomes. Fascinating space and a lot going on there. Um... Dr. Aronica, thank you so much for taking the time today. Where can people find out more about you? So I have a website, it's draronica.com. I, I use it mainly uh, to list my courses at Stanford um, and people can reach out to me. Uh, I also have a YouTube channel. I'm not very active on that, but I, I do um, strive uh, to share my interviews and sometimes translate that with the subtitles in Italian. So also for my Italian followers, I, I would uh, actually love to translate this uh, if you share the recording with me later. Of course, that would be, it would be my honor. And Dr. Ronica, thank you again for taking time out of your busy schedule today to chat fascinating topic and i'm sure this is just the first of many conversations thank you very much it was a pleasure to be here and i hope your audience will uh, enjoy this conversation to all the superhumans listening out there have an epic day